Hello everyone and welcome to a special episode in Kerbal Space Program featuring this, the Super Cruiser Olympus. Uh, basically my goal here was to see how far I could push my computer and how low I could drive frame rates I suppose because this is a heavily modded install and this Super Cruiser eventually ended up being 523 parts. It's not quite there yet here because I have some work to do. But the idea here is a interplanetary cruiser capable of going to Joule about 4,000 meters per second of delta V, so it goes to Joule and makes its own orbit around Joule. And then it has four large ships on its tail that do various jobs, like uh, one science ship and all. It does have two rotating sections there for habitat purposes. It also has a greenhouse and much life support equipment and recycling equipment. But there you see the rotating sections. They don't actually work outside of the SPH, and I don't know why. Um, I've got something misconfigured about them, but uh, yeah, outside the SPH, they use infernal robotics parts, as you can see. Um, also, the, these are the solar panel sections. Uh, they rotate, they extend out and rotate. So yeah, technically not necessary because we have fuel cells as well. Uh, lots and lots of life support. Technically, this is meant to accommodate 17 Kerbals. Uh, there you see it rated for 37. They, they can move about. They have a lot of space. That's why this... There's technically room for 37, but really only meant for 17. And uh, yeah, you can see from the styling on the front end with the Oscar V tanks and all, the, and the toroidal tanks, that I really wasn't trying to keep part count down. Here I'm filling up the KIS container, Kerbal Inventory System, with uh, various parts that we might want to use on our long trip. And uh, actually those will all disappear for some reason when we finally get into space. I don't know why. I guess when you save it, the inventory goes away. Also in the little cargo bay there, we have four Kerbal Mobility Units. And these are for smaller little jobs that we don't need the large ships for. I'll get to the large ships in a sec, but uh, there they are. So um, little command seats and plenty of fuel actually. And uh, two little radial thrusters, I forget what they're called, the equivalent of the ant engine. And also I scaled down Werner ports to 20% so that this could take these could take off vertically off of, let's say, Minmus. Uh, possibly the moon, actually. The moon as well. You can see the Werner ports there. And maneuver about and dock. And it, they don't need mod propellant because they use the Werner ports to maneuver. And so they just have to carry liquid fuel and oxidizer. Anyway, this is, the, this is the the engine section, which also carries the four crafts, the four main craft. I decided to put nine Nervas instead of just four, because with the four, the thrust weight ratio was painfully low, and now it'll just be really low. So there they are, a cluster of nine Nervas, and you can see the radiators there as well. Um, so far, so good on the radiators being enough, though. There is some overheating. I try and tuck them in a little bit to make them look a little bit more photogenic. I'll get the center one in, in a sec. Okay, here I'm building one of the craft on the outside. I had already built the science craft, uh, which you had seen four of on there, but I didn't want four duplicates of the same craft. This is obviously an ore miner craft that I'm making, which uh, will drill for ore and convert it on the surface. And then uh, if it has to be recovered, it will return to the mothership without any load that way uh, with, just with the fuel obviously but no ore load so yeah and that's what I'm going for here trying to get the center of thrust lined up with the center of mass and everything okay you saw me if you saw the solar system colonization series episode you saw me making something similar to this though with a lot more power and four drilling units this is the craft that will actually lift the fuel off of the place where the ore miner is drilling. And basically the idea is Val. You can see I've got the stage sat stats in MechJeb lined up for Val. I'm try trying to check whether this has enough thrust to get off of Val. So that's the idea. I try and use these little... Uh, I, the front to extend outward, but the idea is it to be able to convert from VTOL to horizontal flight. But this was overly complicated. I was trying to figure out how to get the pistons and rototrons right. That's completely reversed, but at least not, not uh, random. 
Anyway, I decided it'd be easier to just do a vertical landing system, and so I tried that. Uh, it has the RCS thrusters at what would be the top, so I could use those, fire those in order to make sure it keeps balance. And ultimately, I decided on the Poodle engine as the best engine for it. Here, this has monopropellant to uh, power the RCS thrusters. So I put one of those on. The science vessel is already on there. And you can see universal storage parts. Lots of mods involved in this install. Environmental visual enhancements as well. So this, this tanker vessel is pretty darn big. And of course we'll use KAS to connect it all together so that the ore miner can transfer fuel to the fuel transfer ship. Here the ore miner is getting added to the assembly. And finally the last craft I decided to put on was an escape craft. Something for the passengers to ditch when things go wrong. Here I, I was initially thinking that it would have 21 Kerbals, but doing some further calculations I decided to cut it down to 17. So here is the craft with room for 17 Kerbals to escape and uh, just a single rapier back there and I decided to test it and see if it could uh, fly properly or just to get a sense of its limits and so here we go the air intakes are by the way built into the cockpit that's a cockpit from Mark II Expansion I think the mod name is very handy mod with lots of good Mark II parts okay here we go and so yeah it is able to take flight at a reasonably low velocity 80, uh, 80 meters per second or so no air brakes on this. I hadn't added air brakes or drogue chutes. Probably should have. Anyway, here I'm just trying to push it out of its comfort zone and see how far I can go out of whack with it and then whether I can recover it. At 300 meters, uh, recovery was unlikely. But anyway, this was just a simulation. And that's a good thing too. Actually, uh, I think you'll see more revert flight in this video than you have ever seen in any of my other videos. It'll happen all of twice. Uh, so anyway, I add that little escape vehicle there. And, uh, yep, start it up, of course, because that is one heck of a complicated section right there now. And it looks a little bit iffy on the whole structural integrity thing. So yeah, this ends up being more than 300 tons, this Grand Olympus ship, and of course, lag is abundant. I lock all the fuel tanks on this payload. Um, ultimately, what we find out is that the, that the ship with all of its minor subships, if you will, uh, has a little bit less than 4,000 meters per second to work with, but that's plenty enough to transfer to Jewel and make orbit around it. There you go, uh, 3,816 it looks like. So yeah, that is what our interplanetary vessel looks like. The Olympus in all of its glory. I think it actually has a little bit more Delta V that I forgot to hook up somewhere. But Well, anyway, 311 tons. So the question is, how do we get this to orbit? So now we're in the VAV, and I try to build its launcher. And I knew already that the launcher for such a thing would need to be about 1,800 tons altogether. And so... First we build the center stack. Uh, it's not good enough to just sort of surround it with boosters because then, you know, structurally it's very weak in the center and things will just go flying off. So you need some support in the center. And eventually I decide to use a dummy payload instead of the instead of the actual vessel, even though the actual vessel has little bits sticking out that I would need to work around because, well, the lag was just too huge in the VAB. So here, four mammoth boosters was the idea, and I already knew from the fact that I had estimated that it would be about 1,800 tons that the four mammoth boosters would be enough. So this is all good, but the actual payload is much taller than this, the dummy payload I've got there, so we'll have to see exactly how it fits. But altogether, a nice looking launcher. There we go, now we have the payload on it. And you can see how it's working together. We'll use the boosters to provide some extra, extra structural support. And you'll see me strutting it up. 
we're using procedural SRBs as uh, separatrons instead of the actual separatrons because we'd have to put quite a lot of separatrons to make it work out and uh, it's as if we didn't have enough part count already anyway so right now we're around 600 parts so the launcher is about a little more than 70 so there you go you get another view clearly we have 4,000 meters per second of delta V in the launcher and then we have uh, plenty in well it says 3,767 meters per second in the payload right now well anyway it is time to see if this works that's how it looks on the launch pad it's not the biggest thing anybody's ever launched. I mean obviously many people have launched many bigger things in Kerbal Space Program um, it's a little bit unwieldy though I have to mention that there is Kerbal Joint Reinforcement there is no far Ferrum Aerospace would have uh, killed me for this so here we go. Uh, you see there's already quite a bit of a wiggle and the uh, payload is listening to one side. So it's not a good situation. And a worse situation is the fact that we are controlling from the top. We're controlling from the cupola or uh, maybe the cockpit. I think it's built around the cockpit. But uh, yeah, either way you don't really want to be controlling from something at the top of this. So that's part of the problem here, and you'll see the engines have to wiggle to overcompensate. I make a valiant effort to hold together. Oh, by the way, this is running at 4x time, uh, not time warp, but I've compressed the video by four times. So if you think the frame rates are bad here, it was actually running at four times less than this. So yeah, be thankful that I did compress the video, and... Uh, well, like I said, I was trying to see how much my computer could take and what it would do with uh, such a large, complicated vessel with all these mods as well. Obviously, uh, for me, 500 parts would run much faster if I didn't have all these mods. If it was pure stock, I wouldn't say it run, it'd run like a breeze, but it would run a lot better. Actually, in my Sandbox EDB series, with the Orion 1 Space Liner docked at Hoffman Station, that, that complex actually has about the same number of parts and that runs about four times higher the frame rates so just the mods uh, knock the frame rates down by a factor of four basically well, and one of the mods is environmental visual enhancements and there are other very intense stuff like uh, procedural parts has a lot of configuration stuff anyway but uh, it is quite amazing that I managed to get this up as high as I did considering how badly it was deviating from the prograde vector. But eventually it was pretty much impossible to hang on to it. So we're just waiting for a catastrophe to occur here. But I did want to try out booster separation. And I also still had one idea for how I might rescue Jeb. Well, we'll see that in a moment. I'm not cutting anything out about the wiggling here. You'll see exactly where I decide it has gone too far. It's actually holding up pretty well altogether. I mean, it's not just breaking apart randomly. But then again, there's Kerbal Joint Reinforcement, huh? Okay, engine shutdown and booster separation and not your normal separatrons. Remember, these are procedural SRBs, actually. Just they're really, really tiny procedural SRBs. So they have these huge flames coming out of them. And we couldn't really see what happened to the main vessel until they cleared out. But it's actually still intact, which is good. So actually, it, uh, they, it took out one engine, but that's because this whole thing was flipping around. But altogether, pretty good on the booster separation. I decided it was okay. And uh, here's here's my attempt. I was trying to transfer Jeb to the to the escape pod, right? Well, escape plane, really. Uh, that did not work, and I don't know why. But I mean, I don't have connected living space or anything like that. But uh, possibly because of the lag or something like that, I couldn't transfer him. And obviously, EVAing him, well, that's not a good way to escape. So I just decided to revert flight, and there you go, that's the second reversion, most ever. Now I immediately had a plan of how to fix this, 
and that's to put a controller on the base. Remember, the problem in my mind was that we were controlling from the payload, which is not good because it's wiggling around all over the place and exacerbating the problem. So the idea is to put a little probe core right there, and as you can see, using a radial attachment point, and that we can control from on the launch pad. So there you go, I uh, select it and control from there instead of the top, and let's see how that works. Uh, not a substantial amount of additional struts or anything like that, by the way. So that was the main change here. And as you can see, it's already starting out much better. That is not to say that there aren't going to be problems. And it was very difficult to handle. I certainly wouldn't trust Smart ASS with this because Smart ASS would overcompensate and start throwing it this way and that a little bit too much, overuse the gimbling and all. But here we go, we're, uh, we're going up and here is where I decide to start the turn here, pitch program. So just gingerly nudging it a bit and it's looking alright. And again, part of that is thanks to the fact that the boosters are providing support, so you might guess what's eventually going to come up. But so far, so good. Now, before this, it might have been hard to see that I was struggling with the craft, but here it's a little bit more obvious that I'm, I'm uh, really, really trying to force it to stay on prograde, and it's not always cooperating. It's we're approaching the speed of sound here, going transonic, and clearly it's getting a little bit more drag than before, and more lift for that matter. And we do have many, many aerodynamic surfaces on here. Yes, indeed. But anyway, I get straightened out and we proceed. Again, this is a uh, video sped up by four times, so this was a very leisurely ride. I certainly didn't want to repeat this, so I wanted to see this hit up safely this time. I was being cautious, as you can see I've throttled down by a bit, keeping the acceleration to about 1.5 G's. And we're getting close to booster separation here, about 1.6 G's, still, still throttled down, keeping it very moderate. Uh, here we go, engine shutdown, and separation. Those enormous flames, those are some seriously excessive plumes from really, really tiny SRVs. But now you see the problem. Now that the support from the SRVs has been removed, we have a bit of a flex going on here. And I've actually shut down the engines because of this flex. We do have an apoapsis that is in space. We will get to space. But we're not going that fast horizontally. So we do need to burn the stage for, for its duration. Possibly even go to the next stage to complete orbit. But it's proving a little bit difficult. I, I carefully try and ignite. You can see just... Uh, a sixth of the full power available and you'll begin to see something happening here eventually I mean aside from the fact that it's sort of shaking from side to side like that there is a compression yes it's turned slinky on us uh, specifically at the rotating sections where the infernal robotics parts are. There are infernal robotics washers that are supposed to create the rotation. Really those rotating habitat sections proved to be more trouble than they were worth and I was definitely reconsidering those at this point, possibly replacing them with some other habitat module. There's those rotating centrifuge sections from the habitat pack that could work. But uh, well, too late for that now. This is already in space and so we proceeded. This was a live stream, of course, and one viewer, Mikko, reminded me to just go with the Rhino and turn off the mainsails, but actually, I didn't have enough thrust, so ultimately, I 
I turned on two of the mainsails again to give us a little bit more and you can see we're running at full thrust here now after the initial startup uh, we managed to get it going to about 1G but that didn't mean that it wasn't without its flexing and again this is four times the actual speed we saw it at so so this flexing is happening very very slowly anyway we are about to run out actually there's still fuel in the other two main sails the conic tanks that are attached to them but I decided not to use that fuel so we actually had just enough fuel to get into orbit if we wanted to run that run those two main sails with their fuel but I decided not to use them so that the tank would re-enter so that that core stage would re-enter and we could just finish up the orbit with the nuclear engines on the Olympus. So there we go. Separation has occurred and we'll be running on the nuclear stage. I tried to extend the solar panels but there was a big flaw. You'll note that I've attached struts between the solar panel arms and the rotating habitat modules and that's turning those little uh, containers askew. Mm, that was a big mistake on my part. Uh, this would have all worked triumphantly. This would have been a great, great accomplishment to get this to orbit. If not for the fact that I had put those struts on. Those struts uh, were a big mistake. And here's me figuring that out and trying to think about what to do about it. But I think ultimately what's going to happen is that we just won't be able to use the solar panels. And actually rotating those sections was going to be a pain anyway. So... Uh, I, it just doesn't work right out here. It works great in the SPH, but not out here. But uh, the only possibility really is to use an engineer and try to have the engineer grab the, the strut somehow, but we don't know if that would work. I'll have to see. So here I am bringing the Olympus to orbit very, very, very slowly. Nine Nervas are not much to move this thing around, still at 300 tons. You can see one meter per second squared. But there we go, we finally manage it. And as soon as I do, I decide to have Jeb take a look around and see if he can do anything about the struts. Really, he can't. he's not an engineer, obviously, but I temporarily forget about that. But along the way, getting him to do this... I find out that my inventory is gone. Remember how I put all those parts in that inventory can right there? Well, they're not there anymore. Uh, and I wanted to have him get the tools to maybe do something with the strut, but no luck. And there aren't any tools in these little guys either. Uh, each of these Kerbo Mobility units had a KIS container, and those were supposed to have, uh, you know, wrenches and drills in them. No luck though. This is a good view of the whole ship with a Kerbal floating by. A Kerbal for scale, if you will. But, uh, yeah, so it was, a, it was a sweet accomplishment getting this whole thing up in a space on just a second try, really. Um, but a little bit disappointing because I couldn't deploy it fully the way I wanted it to be deployed. We'll have to transfer the rest of the crew up. And I guess we'll transfer the additional inventory supplies then. For now, I decide to do the one thing I could do, which is extend the radiators. So that's a Super Cruiser Olympus, and I'll continue on with this in my Twitch stream on Saturday. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.